Hey guys, King Gath here with Bethesda Mod School. In this lesson, we're going to go right back to the same script we ended with on 101, and we're going to pick up with the deployable turrets mod, and we're going to make a couple of improvements to this mod with the goal of teaching you guys a few new things about Papyrus. So the things we're going to fix are there's an issue where depending on the surface you drop the turret on, it could end up on a weird angle. And so we're going to solve that and make sure that the turret's always resting flat. And then the other thing that could come up is that item that you actually drop doesn't get destroyed or converted into the turret but instead is just left on the ground so you could just keep picking it up and dropping it over and over again and get yourself infinite turrets from just one of these buildable deployable turrets so we're going to make it so that uh, those kind of get consumed and become the turret and uh, then maybe in a future tutorial we'll make it so that you can pick that turret back up but for now we're just going to focus on making sure the player can't get infinite turrets out of this so while teaching or while making these two changes i'm going to teach you a couple of things one i'm going to teach you how to make your own function and keep in mind when I do these things some of the stuff if you're a seasoned programmer you're gonna see they're not necessary for the way we've written this script or if you think about the scheme of how the script is being used we're like we're going to write a function that's not strictly necessary to be a function because it won't get reused uh, but don't worry about that if you're a, a programming vet and I'm doing something weird definitely feel free to comment on it just in case it was something that I missed but for the most part I'm kind of contriving some of these things just for the sake of teaching new concepts um, and I, I want to keep building on a single mod so that people can go from beginning to end and get all of the steps along the way so that they're not lost if they were at a different level of programming at the time. So what I've done here is I've opened up this script that we ended with on the last tutorial and I've copied the code into a new file so that I can edit it and we'll still have a, a copy of this one that I can keep in the toolkit and the one that we've released on Nexus which is a, a companion kit if you haven't downloaded this there's a companion thing on Nexus that uh, I will link in the description and basically it's just random files and things that I've created during all of the different Bethesda Mod School lessons so that you guys can have that stuff on your computer without trying to read the text on my screen. All right, so the first concept we're going to cover is something that we started talking about in the last video, and that's the fact that different forms can represent different types of forms depending on which ones they were extended from. And we talked about that because we were able to use an actor base in PlaySetMe, even though PlaySetMe, if you looked at its definition, which I showed you on creationkit.com, is asking for a form. And so we determined we could do that because actor base is actually extended from form. So I wanna expand on that information a little bit because it's really useful to understand so that you can figure out how to do things because most of programming is just puzzle solving. You're basically, you have a starting point, you have an objective, and you just have to figure out how you're going to get there. And so you've got to use the tools at your disposal to get there. And one of the most common ones you'll run into when you're doing script things is that the different properties and forms and functions that are available to you might not match exactly what you need to do. And so sometimes you've got to manipulate things to get to where you need to be. So we're going to talk about our deployable turret demo here. So this right now is extending object reference. So we could say in a way that object reference is a parent to deployable turret demo. I'm going to reference. I'm going to demonstrate that, or I'm going to uh, show that like this. So I'm going to put put a little diagram up here. So object reference is kind of a parent to deployable turret demo. For those of you who are regular programmers, uh, the deployable turret demo inherits object reference. Um, for everybody else, if you're, I'm, I'm going to try and use just more generic terms just for the sake of things everybody can understand without having any assumptions about what inherit means. I think parent and child is a good understanding thing that is used also in computer science, but I think most people can understand that, um, is that uh, essentially deployable turret demo would be a child of object reference, and object reference is the parent to deploy deployable turret. So object reference kind of gave birth to deployable turret demo, uh, and so the deployable turret demo has has all of the hereditary information of object reference, but object reference does not have any of the data about deployable turrets. So things go in one direction. So everything that's apparent, you can treat the child as. So deployable turret can act just like an object reference. So if you had a function that was asking for an object reference and you sent it a deployable turret, that would totally work. But if you had something asking for a deployable turret, you would not be able to send it an object reference. Now, what's interesting about object references is that they are not the top level, even though you might think that they would be, because they represent game objects. So uh, if we go to the Creation Kit site and look up object reference, so we'll go ahead and put that in the search here, uh, you'll see that it actually has something that it extends from. In fact, almost everything in the game extends from 
form, which we talked about before. So you can see object reference extends form. So if we were to punch that and add that into our little hierarchy here, um, form is the parent object reference, which is the parent of deployable turret demo. So once again, we could say, uh, if something was asking for form, we could send it an object reference and we could send it a deployable turret demo. But if something, something was asking for an object reference, we can't send it just a form. Uh, and then if you look at form, it also extends one more level to a level that you'll almost never use until we get to really high level stuff, such as making mods communicate with each other without dependencies. That's really advanced stuff. I would love to cover at some point, but not anytime soon. But we'll go ahead and just for thoroughness, we'll put that here as well. So uh, so the, the hierarchy right here that inherits is script object is the parent of form, which is the parent of object reference, which is the parent of deployable turret demo. Um, so anything, so if you're requesting any of the types, you can always send in a function. So if a function asks for a particular type, you can always send one of the lower levels, but not the other way around. So that's an important concept to grasp because sometimes uh, you will get to a point where a function is asking for a particular type and you don't have that. So you can use the creation kit uh, site or you can use the scripts themselves because things like object reference and form all actually have function or actually have definition files included with the creation kit that you can actually access and you can search those up in the papyrus manager. So if we search up in here for object reference, Uh, so if we go here, so we've got object reference here. So we can search for that and uh, open it up. And we can see that it extends form. So all of the actual information that's on the creation kit site is actually also just available in raw script format. And there's a lot of uh, notes in there. And there are uh, random bits of information that are useful from Bethesda. So it's actually useful to grab these as well as the creation kit site. I just find uh, the creation kit site to be a lot more convenient than digging around in Papyrus Manager. All right, uh, so we know that uh, we know now that how this hierarchy uh, works, how the inheritance works in uh, Papyrus for those of you who are uh, vets. And there's another point where this becomes relevant, but not exactly. So uh, one of the things that you'll end up often doing is comparing uh, types. And you might think that you have to compare types to the same type, and that's not actually true. So when you're doing comparisons, uh, so if we look at here, we've got a, an AK old container and we're comparing it to game.getplayer. You might think, based on some of the things I've been talking about, that you have to compare apples to apples. You might think, oh, I have to care, compare an object reference to an object reference. That's kind of true, but what's actually happening when you're doing comparisons of uh, forms is it's comparing what's called the form ID. And this is a hex code. And if you were to go into the creation kit, we can find that under this form ID. ID column and uh, basically the uh, the form ID the last six digits are the are the form ID for that particular form the first two are the load order so you definitely you generally leave those as zeros when you're writing though it's very rare that you're ever going to actually write up a form ID until we get to that really advanced stuff I mentioned about intermod communication so don't get hung up on that don't don't get hung up on that uh, but the form ID is that's what it's actually comparing it'll be like do these two particular objects have the same form ID and when you're talking about object references, which are generally copies of things. So an object reference of Abbott would be a copy of this Abbott record. Uh, the object reference itself gets a new form ID created at runtime during the game. And uh, if you were ever to click on one of those things, if you click on most things in the game, such as a settler, uh, anything that was created after the game started, if you click on it in the console, you'll see a little eight digit hex code come up. And the first two will usually be FF if they were created, if their object references created at runtime. If they're not created at runtime, which means they weren't created by a script, but instead were placed somewhere in the world by Bethesda or by a mod author. Um, instead, if you were to double click on one, and I'll go ahead and open up a cell just so I can show you that. And uh, well, I'll get where I have one that's, that I know exactly where. Uh, let's see. Yeah, okay, I got it on my recent cells. So we'll go to Abernathy Farm. All right. So I'll, I'll show you another little thing you can see just for the sake of uh, understanding how this works is that uh, these, remember that these things here I, I mentioned in the last tutorial that actors in the CK are actually actor bases. And actors themselves are just the name of an actor base as an object reference. It's confusing, um, but it's, it's gonna be relevant in a second. So uh, what they'll end up having is they've got their actor base form ID, which is what you see in this column, but then they also have an object reference ID. So they were created at, so if they were created at runtime or if they were dragged into the, uh, into the world. So if we go ahead and look at a unique NPC, let me try and find, uh, 
Mr. Abernathy here. Okay, here, yeah. and I've got, uh, let's see if I've got him clicked. Here we go, Blake Abernathy. Um, so if you see here on this screen, if I double click in the, uh, on a item inside of this window, you'll see that there's the base object and you can see it's got this form ID. And if we scroll through here on this window in the background, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, uh, the Blake Abernathy, so it's 6B4D3. And then you can see on here, base object, it's the same one. So that's his base object. And then the actual reference goes in the upper right-hand corner of this little window that pops up when you double-click on something. That's his object reference ID. So that's the idea of this specific uh, version of him. So if I were to drag another Blake Abernathy into the world, he would have a different object reference, but he would have the exact same base object. So when you're actually comparing things that are not things like numbers or... Uh, uh, strings, so that a string would be uh, like a, a thing of text, like a specific name or something like that. If you're comparing two just arbitrary objects, what you're actually comparing are either the object reference IDs or the form IDs, depending on whether or not they extend from object reference. So all that becomes relevant when we get into some of our changes. All right, so keep all that in mind because I, I need to talk about something else now, and I apologize that this is jumping around a little bit, but there's a lot of back information that you need. So one of the things that will come up later in your scripts and as you get deeper into modding is you'll find that a script lag becomes a thing where you, your scripts that seem really good on their own start to become a problem in bulk or on a larger scale or in a big save file or when a player has a lot of mods. And the reason for that is that a lot of the way we, we tend to write scripts in Papyrus, because it's so easy, we tend to do things suboptimally and not realize the penalty because it won't come up for quite a while. It tends to be that because players like to play with tons of mods in Bethesda games, and they like to play their same character for a long time, that you end up with a, any inefficient script causing a massive pileup later. So it's best to get in the habit of optimizing your scripts now. And one of the easiest ways to optimize your scripts is to use local variables whenever you're accessing things outside of your script. Okay, that was a lot to unpack. So let's, uh, let's take a step back here and then we'll tie it back into what I just talked about about all this nonsense here. So uh, right now we can see that we have a couple of calls to a script outside of our own, and that's with this game. So this is one of the easiest ways you can test and look to see if you're if you're likely calling outside of your own script. If you see this dot notation somewhere, it's a good chance you're calling something outside of your script. You're accessing some other script and asking for something. That's what that dot tends to mean. It's like give me access to a property or give me access to a function inside of you. And so in this case, game is an external script. Now game is a special exception. It's a global script. It's meant to just kind of provide a lot of useful utility quickly um, so this one actually is somewhat immune to what I'm going to talk about but it doesn't matter it's it will work for the sake of me showing you how this example is going to work so when you find one of these dots that's a good chance that you're accessing outside of your script and then you want to look for in your script any point where you're accessing the same thing multiple times because what you're doing here is you're going you're, you're reaching outside of your script to call game and the reason that that's a problem is that even though modern games and engines are all multi-threaded, they tend to still have, especially with this engine, they tend to have only one access point per script. So that, and that prevents, or helps prevent something called race conditions, which is where two things in a, and I guess I need to take a little step back because if you don't understand what multi-threading is, basically it's what allows a single program to do a lot of things in the same, like, millisecond like within that same exact time exact moment in time they can do multiple things they're not limited to just doing one thing at a time linearly which would basically make software run, run like crap and you end up with you know that's that's what older computers were like so if you play really old computer games a lot of those would have been uh, and i don't even know how far back you'd have to go but they would be uh what would call single threaded where each thing runs one at a time and it limited largely what you could do so one of the problems with multi-threading is if you have two things trying to touch the same item at the exact same moment, uh, they could create they one value one could write a value or change a property or call a function that invalidates the call of the other one, and it can cause all sorts of chaos. So to help limit that, uh, it doesn't completely eliminate it. But uh, what Bethesda has at least done with Creation Kit stuff is uh, things will queue up if they are calling outside of their script if they're calling the same script. So if you get two things at the same moment calling a particular script outside of themselves, they will queue those up and one will happen, then the next will happen. Now this, there are still ways this can lead to race conditions. I'm not gonna get into that yet, it's too complicated. Uh, but just know that whenever you're reaching outside of your script, you're basically uh, potentially causing a traffic jam down the line. So, uh, especially when you get into things like like looping, where we're just doing the same process over and over again, or if we've got a big list of things we need to test. So anytime you see in your script, 
that you're accessing the same thing over and over again. So whether it be right within multiple lines of code, or if, for example, if I were talking about a loop, for those of you who are vets to programming, uh, if you had something inside of your loop that was calling outside of your script, and that data was gonna be the same at every iteration of your loop, you should just call, you should save this as a local variable. So in this case, we found one, I can see one example where we're getting the, we're calling outside of our script for the exact same thing multiple times, and there's no way this can change. So there's no reason whatsoever to, to call this twice. Instead, we should save this as a local variable. Um, so game.getPlayer, no matter what, is always going to just return the player. There's never going to be some other player that it's going to return. So we know that's always going to be the same thing. And so to do, to get access to this and save it in a variable, the first thing we need to do in order to declare a local variable is know what type of variable we're going to define. So there are some a lot of different types of variables in Papyrus. Uh, the general ones are going to be a string, which is just a block of text. There's going to be an integer, which is a number without a decimal. There's a float. Uh, and I'm sorry, integer is uh, int, is what you'll see in uh, inside of some of these scripts. So it'll look like, uh, oops, it'll look like this. So if you see a, a variable declaration start with int, that means integer or number without a float or without a decimal. I'm sorry. Then if you want a decimal, you use uh, float as your type. Um, and then we talked about string. And then there is bool, which is either true or false. So the whatever that stands for boolean, it's either going to be true or it's going to be false. And it's a those are very useful. Um, and then there are other types we're not going to get into now, such as uh, structures. And uh, if you're an advanced programmer and you want to know how the, the format for array, just while we're here, is to just add brackets to either side of your declaration. Um, but then the other most common type of, of these is to use any script name. So it could be it could be this. It could be we could declare this as a variable, or we could declare object reference as a variable, or we could declare form as a variable. So any type of script can be declared as a variable type. So uh, a lot. So what you need to know is what are you going to declare as your variable type? That's the first line of making a local variable. So in our case, we want to save game.getPlayer as a variable. So we need to know what is game.getPlayer returning? What is player? Uh, so we're going to go ahead and look that up. So I've already searched that up here. And we can, if we look at the function definition here, you see the function is named getPlayer. It returns an actor. So whatever comes to the left of the word function, that's what that function is going to return back to you. So that means that when you call game.getPlayer, uh, you are going to get an actor. So in that case, we know that our local variable type is actor. Now we need to name our specific variable. So we're just gonna call this, and this is where we're gonna talk about something I mentioned before of, of explaining some of this naming scheme that I use. Um, so we're gonna name this K player ref. And there's a very specific reason I named it this. So uh, first off, you'll see that you, the letter K appears all over my script. So K, the idea behind it is Bethesda has decided for whatever reason, I'm sure they have some logic internally that I'm not privy to, or maybe somebody knows, maybe this is a general programming thing that I just have never heard before, but they use K to represent object references. Um, so of those other types I showed you, they use S for string, they use I for integer, F for float, B for Boolean, makes a lot of sense. So then for whatever reason, they've chosen K as object reference, and it just makes it easier to at a glance because later on in your script, you're often not going to see this part. You're not going to see the definition, especially um, when it comes to when you start accessing things called global variables, which we're not going to talk about right now. We will eventually, but it comes to a point where it can be very difficult to figure out at a glance what this variable is. What what type of data could it possibly be holding, especially when you get to very long scripts? And so by standardizing the naming scheme and putting a particular letter up front, you just know at a glance, anywhere in your code you see that, you can tell what type it is so you know how you can act on it. So this is a very good habit to get into. So for whatever reason, K is, is object reference. If one of you know, definitely post that in the description. You'll see that in my the object reference definitions here, so in the actual uh, arguments of the event, they start with A, and that's for argument. And so that tells you if you see something that starts with A, you should go and you're trying to figure out what it is, you should go look at the uh, the argument list. But more importantly, they tend to follow up that A again with that first letter. So just looking at something called AK new container, we automatically know, okay, this is something defined in the arguments of the, of the event, and we know it's an object reference type. So that gives you most of the information you know. And then 
the naming part, this is, I mean, naming is very important because of readability. You want to be able to come back in the same way we talked about in the last video, how important it is to comment your code. Uh, this isn't just for others. Often it's going to be yourself. You're going to have to come back and troubleshoot something or you're going to add a new feature. And if you do a poor job naming things, you're not going to have any idea of what you're talking about. The other reason that's good to name things is they tend, names actually tend to help you maintain scope in programming so that you don't make something do too much. Um, and that will become more apparent later when we start talking about code efficiency and everything, but that's way later. So, uh, but just, just get in, if you get in a good habit of prefixing your uh, variable names with something relevant and that's something standardized, you're, you're going to have a much better time. And then the uh, capitalization decision, this is uh, a common programming technique. Uh, it's something camel case. And uh, it's basically that the, the idea is the lowercase letters are the, in, uh, the lower parts of the camel humps and then the capital letters are the uh, the actual humps and it just makes it easier to read I there's probably there maybe there's a larger explanation behind why they decided to do that I love the way it looks I think it's very easy to read if you put uh, the beginning of each word capitalized so that you're not just looking at a big wall of text especially if you opt to make a very descriptive variable name uh, where it can get very long I mean even something like deployable turret actor is pretty long and if you look at that if I switch these to all lowercase it's just harder to look at. It's harder to figure out what exactly, you know, where are my word breaks? Where am I, uh, how am I supposed to read that? It looks just like a mess of characters, especially if you're looking at somebody else's script. So uh, as far as I know, the whole point of the camel case is just to uh, make it easier to read. So I like to do that. So we're gonna say, okay, actor, cape. So you start out in a variable definition. You start out with the, t the script type or the variable type in the case of those non-script types, such as int, bool, float, or string. Uh, and then you name it, and then you put an equal, and you don't have to do this equal. So this is, if you're a programmer, you can just declare a variable and not do anything. That's totally fine. You don't have to have it equal to anything to make it a declaration. Um, in fact, with globals, for certain types, that's a mandatory thing. You can't always, there are some types you're not able to define within a script within the same line that you declare it. If you didn't understand what I was just talking about with declare, don't worry about this. That, that wasn't for you. <laughs> um, so we're going to go kplayerref equals, uh, and then we're going to take this game.getplayer. So we know game.getPlayer is going to be an actor, so it will successfully save in this local variable. So now we have the player saved in this variable here. And because we defined this variable within this event, this is considered local. That means as soon as this event ends, so as soon as this code gets down to here, this gets let go of, from memory. And that's very important because if you were to try and save every single variable out here, outside of an event or outside of a function, those would be globals. And those, unless you manually clear them yourself, which would get very tedious, uh, will remain using up memory as long as this object, as long as this script object exists. And you would just eat up all of the memory in the game very, very quickly. So uh, declaring local variables uh, basically allows you to uh, set up something that's a little more efficient within your script so they're not talking to each other and causing those queue blockups uh, at the expense of temporary memory usage. So it's a great usage because memory is cheap, uh, processing power is less cheap. So it's a good idea to use these when they come relevant, when they become relevant. Now you don't necessarily need to use them all the time, though sometimes um, it can be useful to just get in the habit of doing those even for things you're only using once just because then if you edit the script later, you've already got that configured. So it might be a good habit to get into. Um, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna find all calls to game.getPlayer in our script and just replace them with kplayerref because it means the same thing now. So now if we just replace those, the script, if you were to compile this, would run exactly the same. Obviously not because, it actually wouldn't compile because I have this garbage down here um, that I was just using to teach you, but uh, if you were to get rid of this and compile this, this would work identical. So now, uh, we talk again, or now we get back to tying it into the different types and the conversions and comparisons and all that. So I mentioned earlier that you might think, hey, um, object reference, the AKA old container here, we're comparing it to the player ref, but that's an object reference and that's an actor. And I mentioned that uh, it doesn't actually compare them uh, based on exact types and instead it's comparing them based on form IDs, but there are two types of form IDs. There are the form ID of the object in the creation kit, which is what we showed here. And then there's the form ID of the object reference. So uh, this is where it comes in handy to understand this. If we look up actor, which I believe I have already up here, you can see it extends object reference. So it will have an object reference uh, form ID that it can compare correctly to and uh, to an object reference. So if we replaced it, we replaced that with this here and looked at our the way our hierarchy set up, we can see um, that actor is, of course, a an object reference type. Um, 
so it would work to compare to other object references. So anything that has an object reference as a parent will be able to compare to other object references and then things that only are tied to form can compare to other forms at that level. So if anything that extends from object reference though and you use and you do some sort of comparison to them. So if you're equal equal means which means are these two things the same or if you did not equal which means are these two things not the same. Uh, if they have object reference somewhere in their hierarchy you're saying that you want to compare them based Based on the object reference ID and if they don't have object reference but have form it's going to compare them uh, based on the form ID and if they have neither of those if they only have script object they are not comparable so hopefully that will explain everything if you start running into issues where you're trying to compare because comparing things is one of the most common things you end up doing in programming you're asking the computer to tell me like if it's this uh, if these two things are the same, so what you're basically saying is, uh, is this old container the player? Uh, you know, that's you're, you're essentially asking questions when you set up these programming uh, configurations of uh, of ifs. You're you're just asking questions and getting them answered. So you need to know how to correctly ask the question. And so this will help you, I think, set that up is knowing uh, how to which ones of these are correct to use with which functions and and things like that. So hopefully that's all clear, because uh, that uh, sets the basis for the next step, which is writing your own function. And the function is where we're going to solve the problems I mentioned in the mod itself. The fun the problem of uh, the the actual turret being awkward and angled, and then the actual removal of the droppable item so that it can't just be reused over and over again. So we don't have to do this in a function because there's no location for this to be reused, but we're going to do it because I want to teach you guys functions because it's really really useful, and all of this stuff comes into play now. So uh, what are we going to do for our functions? So the first thing I mentioned last uh, vid that I like to do is define what it is we're going to try and do with our function. And I just put those in comments and then I build the function around those comments. It just makes it easy uh, to lay out my thoughts. So the first thing we want to do is spawn the turret. Now we're already doing that up here, but we're basically my goal is to move that code into a function. So we'll, we'll handle that. So we're going to spawn the turret. Uh, the next thing we need to do is uh, fix the orientation. So we'll make sure that it doesn't end up crooked. And then lastly, we want to uh, prevent uh, reusage. So we'll, uh, I'll talk about how we're going to do that in a bit. All right, so now we know roughly what we're trying to accomplish with our function. So now we'll start to define our function. So to define a function, um, you generally start with the word function, and then you name your function. So in this case, we'll call it uh, deploy turret. So, uh, and then you, you end that with uh, some parentheses. And then uh, you would go end function. And technically, this is a legit function. You could actually compile this and call that. It doesn't do anything, but that is actually the bare minimum requirement for a function definition. So you need the word function, the name of your function, parentheses, and then the word end function. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to move our comments inside of it. Oops. Had an extra tab there. Um, so now we're going to start to build out our function, and then we're going to we're going to change some of these things. We're going to change this definition as we go. I just want to do this in, in chunks so you guys follow along. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we want to move this code here into our function. So we're going to move that underneath spawn turret, uh, and then we're going to move our deploy turret call up here. So now um, this won't actually work, and I'll explain why in a second. But theoretically that would be the bare minimum you would need to do like doing that should be enough but there's going to be a reason why it won't work um, it's just swapping all of a chunk of code into a function and then replacing that chunk outside with that function is largely what you have to do that's all you have to do to get a function to call and to do the work that you want it to because whenever you call a function or when an event is called it basically just does everything in between the start and end words so it's the same thing with functions and events so it once a function the function deploy turret is called it calls everything from the end of this uh, parenthesis to the word end function it calls everything in between there and does what it can with it so in this case it's going to fail because we're using the variable k player ref which we talked about earlier is a local variable to this event so that means once it gets so outside of this event this variable isn't seen so not only is it when you get to the word end event when the code processes not only is this freed from memory as one of the requirement or one of the restrictions with local variables but outside of this little chunk of code here even though this is technically inside of it, it's it's con the the actual call to it is, but the code of it is not. Um, nothing else can see these variables. These are completely isolated. So you can actually reuse the same uh, local variable names all over your scripts. It's totally fine. Um, this is completely inaccessible outside of this little block of code here. So we need to replace this clay player ref with something else. Now we could go and copy this 
down to here. So we could do something like this. And this would work. This would get us where we need to be, and it would totally do that. But uh, there's two problems I see with this. First off, we're, we're redoing work again, which is not ideal. And we're making our function less reusable, which is never good. So one of the beautiful things about functions is if you write them agnostic enough to your specific situation so that they don't care about the specifics of what's going on. They just will do the same thing. It makes it a lot easier to reuse your code. This is one of the good things with functions. And it's one of those things that it will take you a while to wrap your head around. I know when I first started programming, all I would do is just everything was just a one big line. Everything was just a big uh, single blob of, of uh of production code and it would just do what it needed to do, but I could never reuse any of it. And that's uh, a bad habit. And most of you will probably, if you're new to programming, will probably do that for quite a while until one day it clicks why it would be valuable to make some functions. Or maybe you've already had that that uh, light click for you and you know why. Um, I love writing functions. I think uh, making them reusable is super valuable. And in Bethesda's game engine, where things can be all really buggy, um, another nice thing about making things functions is that you can actually call a lot of this stuff from like the console. Um, you can do things like write patches to call these functions later to fix problems. Um, so if you're familiar with some settlements, we have the refresh plot option and that is available because most of the different pieces of some settlements are in functions and we were able to write a, a refresh function that calls all of the necessary functions to fix any problems that might come up with a plot in gameplay due to script lag or due to bugs in uh, different mods. So it's very, very uh, useful to write things into functions. So rather than just redeclaring this and undoing the gain we had here, uh, we're also gonna, we're gonna do something different and we're gonna make our deploy turret function a little more useful. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add an argument. So we're gonna call this object reference and we're gonna name it AK deploy at. So what we're doing here um, is we're saying now deploy turret requires an argument. So you have to send it an object reference. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to make it so that instead of placing at the player route, we're going to we're going to we're going to place at this deploy at. So that means whatever somebody calling deploy turret sends in as the argument. So whatever they put in right here, that is where the turret is going to get placed. So now they basically can send something like they could send the player ref up here. The player ref we know is an actor, but that's based on object reference, so that would work. That's totally legit. That's a, that works as an object reference. And so now this would do the exact same thing. So now K player ref, we're sending it to deploy turret. It will use it as the AK deploy at, and it will place the turret actor there. So now if we were to compile and run this, this would run identical to our original version. So that's perfect. That's where we want to get to. So now we're in. Now we have a function, and everything's working the same. And now we'll work on our um, extra changes now so this just makes the script more versatile um, and in this case it also makes it so that we don't have to call game again to get access to the player instead we're just sending it as an argument to our function um, and then it gets filled in there all right so now let's move on to uh, the fixing the orientation and we're gonna double back and we're actually gonna make a couple more changes up in here still um, so don't think we're done there but I want to I want to move on to the next piece so uh, fixing orientation. So here, this is just something that's not specific to uh, not specific to learning anything new about Papyrus in the grand scheme of things. This is just more talking about a, a quirk with the game I know. So it tends to be that when you place things at the player, the uh, by default when you use place at me, it matches the orientation of whatever thing you're placing at, and the orientation of the player has to do with where your camera is facing. So even though in your head you might imagine that you are only turning your character's head, uh, as far as the game code is concerning, your whole character is turning at that angle that you're seeing, especially in first person. And so the orientation of the player, uh, the rotations on X and Y can get all kinds of weird. And so you can end up with turrets at really weird angles. So to fix this, we just make a call um, to set rotation. Um, I believe that's what it is. Let me double check here. Or is it set angle? Set angle, apologies. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go uh, K turret ref. And uh, I guess I need to do one more thing. So um, up in so in the previous version of this script, so we go back to here, we had um, object reference K turret ref equals game dot get player dot place at me deployable turret actor. Now, um, when I originally explained this, I said it's just a good habit to get into uh, to catch all of the variables that your scripts are returning. So when we have something um, like, and I think I had place at me as the previous, let's see here, nope. Get back in here. Just want to bring up the definition of place at me so we can talk about this with a concrete example in front of us. 
Um, so I, I mentioned that it's a good idea to whenever a function is returning something, so in this case, we see that whatever is before, whatever script type is declared before the word function, that's what the function is going to return to people who are who are calling that function. Um, it's a good idea to just catch those to make sure that you have some sort of local variable set up that this can return its information to. Um, and it's really it's almost mandatory when you want to do things like acting on this. So if immediately following a place at me, you want to do stuff to the turret. In our case, we want to. Uh, change and fix the angle it's a it's an absolute must you must have caught the return that this is sending into a local variable so now we've got our turret and now we can act on it so this is the reference to the turret so now we can do uh, set angle Oops. and what you generally want with things if you want them to just lay flat is you want the the set angle asks for um, the x y and z and i don't remember if it has a fourth field let's go ahead and look that up uh, this is just just good habit to get into is always looking up your functions to see if they have additional uh, fields that maybe you're not familiar with because some of them will surprise you with with extra little options they have that might solve a problem for you. So we're going to look at set angle. So it is accepting the X, the Y, and the Z and nothing else. So we just have to send it three arguments. So we're going to send it 0 0.0, 0, 0, 0.0. Now the reason you have to do, uh, you don't actually have to do it with zero. You don't have to do 0, 0.0, but a lot of times Papyrus will throw you an error. If the type that that excuse me, function is expecting is a float. If you don't actually send it a float, it can get angry. And so I've just gotten into the habit of always sending a number with a decimal, even if it's zero, or if I was sending it one, I would send it 1.0. And that makes sure that the compiler doesn't get angry at you. So zero for X, zero for Y. That means the thing will lay flat. It's not gonna be on a crooked angle, but we maybe still want the thing to face in the same direction as it was. So in that case, we will send it this. Dot Z. So Z is the rotation. Um, so if you're thinking about in workshop mode, if you hold the uh, the rotate left or right button in workshop mode, you know it spins around that. That's spinning around the Z axis. Uh, so we want that to remain the same. We want it, to, and that determines which way it's facing. So we still want the turret to face the same way the player was. So we're going to go ahead and leave the Z alone. Now the reason I can just access Z like this, we showed I showed this in the last tutorial, but I'll go over it again. Is if you look at the top of object reference definition, you'll see that it has built-in properties for the X, Y, and Z coordinates. So we can actually just access those directly without needing to do any fancy function calls. So we can go ahead and do that. And that will, after the turret is created, it will immediately uh, fix the X and Y without changing the Z. So it'll keep the Z the same because it's using, oops, and I did a typo there. It needs to be take K turret ref. Uh, it's basically saying, keep my Z the same by, by sending it that. So now we've got our uh, turret ref orientation fixed. And now we're gonna prevent the reusage. And then we'll come back and we'll do a few tweaks here. So uh, preventing the reusage, so let, let's talk about what exactly this script is doing. So in reality, this script is actually on the objects that you're holding in your inventory. They're not actually on the uh, turret actor that, you're, that appears and starts fighting for you. Uh, so if we think about it that way, we know that this script is on the thing that we want to be eaten. So all we have to do then is tell this item to destroy itself. Uh, and so to do that, we do two things. We do uh, disable. And we're going to send it false, and I'll, I'll show you why in a minute. And then we call delete. So uh, there are the reason you do both of these is you technically could get away with just disable and uh, or just delete rather, and it would handle it. I just like to do to be very explicit and make sure we're doing both. So if you don't call delete and you just call disable, the object will actually remain in memory for a long time and may never actually get cleaned up. Uh, and sometimes that's useful because that's how you might make something disappear. Uh, so for example, if you've played with much some settlement city plans, we use uh, these things called blue men, they're animation markers, and in order to hide them so that you can only see them when you're in workshop mode and you're designing the settlement, uh, we call disable on them and we leave them there, and we never call delete unless the player actually scraps them. So that's useful to be able to disable, which it technically means to hide things, and then delete is what you're telling the game, hey, I don't need this anymore, go ahead and clean it up and get rid of it for good uh, so it's not using up any resources anymore. Now, uh, it might feel odd to just call disable and delete in, in a function somewhere. So if you're not comfortable doing that, if that just looks wrong to you and you want to explicitly understand what's being disabled or what's being deleted, there is a variable built into, uh, into Papyrus called self. And that basically is saying this current object right here. Um, so if you're working on some an object reference or anything extending object reference, you can use self. So we could do, if we wanted to be explicit, we could say self.disable and self.delete. If you've ever used the decompiler, you will find that it does this 
excessively because the entire thing will decompile very, very explicitly. Everything is exactly as it should. And you'll see all sorts of things where it's casting variables as different types. You'll see a lot of references to like uh, this thing as object reference or this thing as actor. That's that's what happens when you decompile because it has to be very explicit. Um, so if you, if you prefer your code to be very clear like that, you can do that. But um, without the self dot, it's the same thing. Um, basically, when you run some of these functions that are on, uh, if you're running a function that is defined in a particular thing. So for example, disable and delete, you would find those under the object reference here. So if we look down here and we look for uh, disable, you'll see it here. Whenever you call these functions not with the dot, you're running them on the current object that you're in. Or in the, in the case of uh, non-object references, you're running. And in the case of non-object references, you won't have any things where you would need to use self. Self doesn't make any sense. Self is something that only makes sense in the context of an object reference. And if that went over your head, don't worry about it. Just know that you can call uh, you can call self dot if you want it to be very clear in your code uh, that you're running these disable and delete on the thing itself that's running this code. Okay, so right now, if we run, if we compile and run this, we're good to go. Everything will work. We fixed the orientation. It was real quick and easy. We've prevented reusage. It was very, very easy. Um, like I said, in a future tutorial, we'll talk about how we can make it so that you can pick up that turret that you created and reuse it later. Uh, but for now, this will be this is good enough. Um, we'll say that this is a balancing mechanism that uh, you once you place the turret, it's it's basically stuck there permanently, and we'll we'll resolve that later. But now I want to make a few other tweaks to this particular script, uh, again, to make it more reusable. So we're going to do something here. We're going to say, we're going to allow deploy at to be nothing. So let's say we want to make it so that there's an option, some other, maybe some other way we call deploy to turret in the future, where instead of the turret deploying at the player, it deploys wherever the object is. So maybe we arrange in the future some way where you could throw this object instead of just dropping it on the ground and then that causes the turret to spawn there which could be really cool so if you want a a particular uh, parameter i'm sorry an argument we'll call we'll stick with argument just because that's often the uh, the two can often be used interchangeably uh, argument and parameter i know they have different meanings but uh on a technical level but i've always used them interchangeable and nobody's had trouble understanding me um, so if i'm wrong there again just like the camel case if you know the specifics the history on it would love to hear it in the comments uh, but uh, we'll call them arguments for the sake of the naming scheme. So if you want to make an argument optional, you basically just need to define what its default is in the in here. And to do that, you would just add equals and then you would add something. Now, object references and things that extend object reference, the only default they can have is none. And that basically means they are completely optional. You can send them either something or nothing. Um, other things like floats or integers or booleans, you can actually send them a specific value. So if we, if this was, um, so if, the, if we were going to add another argument and it was uh, an integer and it was something like uh, number to deploy, uh, I number to deploy, uh, we could, and if I could type, that'd be great. Uh, we could send that in equals one and that would totally work. Um, but object references and things extending object reference are an exception. They can either send nothing as they're, they either have to have it like this. This means that without you sending them a specific object reference, it's just gonna fail. The, the, the code won't compile and it definitely won't run. Or uh, you can send it equals none. And that means this thing suddenly is optional. So the, the code could send nothing. Um, and now we need to be able to react to that. So right now, if we were to run this code and this was blank, so we sent it nothing, um, this would fail because there's nothing for this to place at. This would uh, load up as a null and you'd get an error in uh, the logs. So we need to handle this situation where this equals none. And this is uh, what I want to do to make it just a little easier. So there's two ways we could go about what I'm about to show you. Again, this is one of those things where there's no perfect way to do this, but I'm going to do it this way. Um, we're going to say if... Uh, oops. If ak deploy at equals equals none. So now we're saying we're comparing these things. We're saying if this uh, if this is indeed none. So uh, this is one of those tricky things. And it's just a language thing. Um, a single equal sign means you're saying this thing is the same as this. And if you put two equal signs, it's kind of a question: Is it is this equal to this? So um, two is a question, and one is a uh, uh, making it so. Um, so we're saying if this is true. So is this equal to this? then what we're going to do is we're going to change it. So we're going to say then, in that case, we'll just make deploy at 
And this is where that other thing comes, in, comes into play where I showed you equals self. So now we're saying if the function that called this didn't bother to send us a ref, we'll just default to using ourselves as the point we spawn at. Um, and this is one of those points where this is one of those cases where the only way you could do something like that realistically, uh, I mean, there are, again, I'm, I'm, I'm using that term uh, from my own perspective, I'm sure many people could come up with other solutions. This is one of the wonderful things about programming. There are a million solutions to all these things, but this is one of the most optimal ways to set up access to this current object is to use the word self. It's a special helper word in Papyrus. So now we're saying whenever that function sends nothing, we'll just go ahead and, and deploy at ourselves. And now our function will continue to exist because no matter what, what gets sent here, even if nothing gets sent here, self will always exist. So then this will correctly be allowed to place an object there. So now we've set it up so that in the future, we want to reuse this code. We don't actually have to send anything. We could leave this blank. And now we're saying whenever that turret is dropped, it's gonna go ahead and spawn the turret uh, right at wherever that item happened to land. Totally fine, totally works. Uh, okay, so then, so that's uh, one little change we're gonna make. And then the other change is uh, an efficiency thing that I've only learned through lots of experience. So uh, it turns out that when you use place at me, a couple of things happen. First off, the object that will appear will fade into existence. And this is gonna, we'll, we'll touch back on why I put false here as well. I, I mentioned before I would explain that and I'll get to that in just a second. So when you place an, an object with it, you'll if you have watched, again, I keep going back to some settlements because I know it's a popular mod and a lot of people have seen it. So I can use that as an example. I think most of you have seen, and I, I can't guarantee I can think of a vanilla example that a lot of you will have seen. So if you ever watch some settlements, uh, either playing it or watch a video of it, you'll see that as the buildings build, the new stages, the new uh, chunk of the building will appear. It kind of fades into existence. Um, and that is part of what Place at Me does. And it takes, it takes approximately two seconds for something to appear. Now, during that time, the rest of this script is on hold. Now that might not seem like a big deal, two seconds, but if you had, uh, but again, if we go back to what I was talking about of a player building up giant game files, playing with tons of other mods, um, or if you were trying to do things rapidly. So if you think about something like the city plans and some settlements where it's deploying thousands of items, two seconds for each one, if you just multiply that out real quick. So if we do 2000 times two, we're now at 4,000 seconds, divide that out by 60. I'm not gonna do the math, but uh, it's just a lot, a lot of time. And so we don't want that. We don't want to have to wait for that. We want this to feel like it's instantaneous. Um, so there is a cool little trick we can do here with uh, with Place at Me to prevent that. So we can actually tell it not to fade, um, but we're gonna do something even more advanced than that. And that's just because it's uh, another trick I learned, uh, another point where we can save some time. But first I wanna go to the definition of Place at Me so we can talk a little bit more in depth here. Um, so uh, one of the things we can do here to prevent uh, having to deal with that fade is we can send this. We can send AB initially disabled equals true. So what this will mean is that um, once the object is placed, it'll be invisible. So I mentioned that disabled technically means invisible. It doesn't mean it's gonna get deleted yet. Um, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and, and grab this. We're gonna copy this. Oops, I just opened another creation kit. Um, and then, and actually I don't know why I have two icons there. I must've screwed something up in my UI. Um, but uh, we're gonna go ahead and uh, where are we going to do that? We're going to go here and place at me. And we're going to go ahead and put AB initially disabled uh, equals, and we're going to change that to true. Now, the couple things here, I think I mentioned this in the last tutorial, but just to make sure I didn't, whenever you're skipping variables, so if we go back to here, so we're skipping AI count and AB force persist. Whenever you're skipping, you have to explicitly name the one you want your uh, your argument to go to. If you don't do that, so if we were to instead just type in true, um, when this when this gets compiled, what it's going to see is place at me. Okay, the first one, deployable turret actor, that's going to get paired up with form, and then we've got our second one, true. That's going to pair up with uh, AI count. Wait, true isn't an integer. That doesn't make any sense, and the compiler is going to error. So we have to exp when we're skipping, and uh, I think I talked about this in the last one, but you can only skip ones that have this equal sign in them. Uh, I'm not going to go into why that is. Just know that uh, that is the case. So uh, we can skip all those other ones. So we're going to put this back. I'm going to undo there. So we're going to go AB initially disabled equals true. So now this turret ref is going to be placed invisibly. So um, then we're going to need to make it reappear. So to do that, um, we're going to come down here and, and you'll understand why we do it down here in a second when I explain this disable thing. Um, we're going to go ahead and go ahead and say uh, uh, show turret. So we'll do K 
turret ref dot enable and we're gonna put the false once again okay so um so the this disable and enable false so if we go ahead and look up one of these so if we go back into our uh, object reference here and we look at the function definitions for disable uh, you can see that its only parameter is fade out. So you're saying then when you disable something, uh, this is whether or not it will use that two second fade. So by default, uh, it is not going to fade out, but I like to explicitly declare uh, yes or no to it. I just wanna make sure I can see at a glance that that is gonna be the case. So uh, that's why I like to just go ahead and put those in there. I put the variables in, but they only have one variable, so I haven't bothered to put in the full name. Um, and I've just memorized that, that enable, if you have it true, it means you're doing it slow. And if you do it false, it means you're doing it instantaneously. So now what we've done is by setting the place at me to disabled equals true, we bypass place at me being the one that has to fade it in because place at me always fades in. There's no way to avoid that. Um, but by starting it disabled and using the enable, which allows us to bypass open, oh, I guess I should just trust for thoroughness. I'll show you the enable a definition which this is something really useful if you're ever on a function on the creation kit site that you think is similar to something else if you scroll down to the bottom the c also will often have the one you're looking for that's similar to it which is pretty cool um, but then you can see a b fade in equals false so uh, we can say now we can do this enable down here and we skip that whole two second fade time which is really cool so that's why i did the disable, disable false we want to skip that fade out time we want to make sure that it doesn't take two seconds for it to go away now, the last question left is, why did you do it down here instead of right here? Why did we do this orientation in between? Well, this is a something I've learned over uh, lots and lots of uh, iterations of testing and, and doing profiling of my scripts. It turns out that if you're going to act on anything that is a object reference that's rendered in front of the player, so usually that would be some sort of thing like an actor or a, a turret in this case or a piece of wall or whatever, anything that you're going to alter in such a way that it will result in having to re-render that item. So if it's going to be something like moving the object or rotating the object or shrinking the object, uh, changing something about the object that would be visual, if you do it while the object is disabled, it happens substantially faster. So this is just, I mean, it makes that makes sense when you think about it. It doesn't have to go through the process of re-rendering. Um, so if you leave it disabled, do all of your actions that have physical, uh, uh, that would require a re-render that involves some sort of physical movement generally, uh, and then enable, this will just, it makes the set angle run faster. So these are some tricks I learned. Um, a lot of this stuff, this is overkill for what we were doing, but it seemed like a great place to teach these things because again, uh, place at me is such a, a powerful tool that uh, obviously I've made heavy, heavy use of with things like some settlements and uh, um, there's just a lot of little tricks you can do with it. So I think that should wrap it up for this tutorial. I'm probably way longer than I anticipated going, but if you were to compile this and run it, everything would do what I said and we can compare this. I'll actually include this version here, this deployable turret, which I've 100% tested and I know, and see, you can see here, um, here's one of the things where I talked about where it, sometimes it's a good idea to go ahead and uh, save the variable. And then I can see here that I defaulted to player. So I did things a little bit differently um, in this version that I wrote to test, but it was just getting the general concepts all working. And I can actually see one other thing I did, and this I'm glad I checked in here that I'm going to show you guys to do. So um, we mentioned before catching variables. Well, I wanted to make sure you understand how you can send back things with your own function. So if you want your function that you wrote, so one of the points of this tutorial was to, or this lesson was to show you how to write your own functions. If you want to send back information, you just put the script type you want to send back, or you can also send back things like integers or floats by just putting in int or float. Um, so anything that you would use to declare a local variable, you can also use here and you can return it. And then to return that information, you just use the word return. So in this case, we're going to just go ahead and return our turret reference. So then the, uh, the script up here, if it wanted to do something else to our turret after it got it, it could do so. So we'll just come down here and we'll type in return k turret ref. That's it. So now we've got we've got our function, uh, and it actually returns something that the other end could use. So then, if we want to be completely thorough, we could come up here and do uh, k turret ref equals, and now we're catching the variable that that function is returning. So now, if we wanted to do more stuff in here and get all crazy and mess mess with the turret more, you know, maybe we do uh, we scale it up ten times and make it a mega turret. Uh, we could do that, but basically. Uh, uh, that is all that's required in a function. It's that that's that simple. So you define uh, the type you want to return, the word function, the name of your script, any arguments you want to include inside of parentheses, whatever you want to happen, and then end function. And that's it.
All right, guys, I hope that clarified some things about Papyrus. Definitely post your questions in the uh, in the comments below, and I will use that information to derive the Papyrus 103 tutorial when we get to that.